let's keep going on with even more cards. And here we have uh, Demacian Santa Claus hanging out in his workshop. Uh, this guy being specifically the egghead researcher, because he's got a head for eggs and he likes to research them, so he's an egghead. Ha 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 ha. This is a good pun. Um, anyway, framing. Well, I suppose you can probably pick it out yourself by now. We have. Uh, well, the egg itself is kind of part of the, of the thing, but the egg frames the character along with all the clutter that we got in the foreground. This dragon model, you can see little like, pickled dragons, I guess, in these jars, little tiny baby dragons, whatever. Um, and then the egg itself helping to single out the character, who's also singled out by the color choices, which again, we have lots of whites and browns, earth tones, and like sort of desaturated colors hanging out mostly in the background, and then the bright red overcoat of uh, Dragon Santa Claus here in the foreground as he's very intently listening to this egg, which he's hitting with a hammer, which, I don't know, seems like a bad idea somehow. <laughs> like, maybe not the first choice of thing I'd do with a dragon egg, but okay day then, you are the researcher you know better than I. Lovely expression from the guy, too. Like, you can see he's kind of really listening hard and, like, trying to figure out, oh, what's going on with this egg? How fascinating. Um, he's also incredibly buff, as people in chat are. Yeah, they, Daddy Eggman can visit me every anytime. Yeah, they're they're already going off on it, as, uh, as well as the right to do. It's okay. But, yeah, the lighting, again, helping to center the character and the egg. Like, the egg is essentially the secondary character in, in this interaction, with uh, him being the primary character. But, again, the lighting falling down on him, making sure to highlight his face and his features, especially against the background, which is a little bit more desaturated and a little bit... Uh, it's still bright, but it's not lit up in the same same way that he is. Uh, right. Moving on to something quite different, which is... Well, literally just gremlins. Uh, they're gremlins. Like, that's what they are. They're gremlins. I hope Riot doesn't get sued for copying gremlins because that's what they are. They're gremlins. Um, but here's an interesting thing. Because the main character of this card art isn't the Evershade Stalker who's technically, like, the thing that's on the card. The main character of this card art is this luckless little fool who is about to have a very bad time indeed. Um... <laughs> And you can see that he's the main character because, like, you have this tree trunk, this dark tree trunk that leads down to him. You have the gates forming this V-shape that kind of, again, leads your eyes to him. He's framed by everything else in the image as the central character because he's the central victim <laughs> of what's about to happen. And part of the point of not having any one of the gremlins be the main character is, of course, that their mechanic is that they swarm. Nightfall, create a copy of me in hand. That's the point, is like you play one of these guys, and then he creates a copy of himself in hand, and then you play that guy, and then he creates a copy of himself in hand, and then you play that guy, and he creates a copy of himself in hand. So you can play like 18 gremlins all at once if you have the mana to do it, or if you have some card that can reduce their cost. Um, so the point of them is swarming, and that's what they are about in this particular card art, where we have like just this horde of little bastards getting ready to do some bad shit to this poor guy. Um, and that's the idea of them. That's why there isn't really a main gremlin character. The reason this guy is picked out is because he's the only one whose face is really visible to us. Um, but the point of the card is the horde is, like, just the sheer teeming mass of them, um, which is their gameplay mechanic, which, again, nice little unity between the card art and what the actual card really does in terms of telling the story of what the card is. Moving on to Bilgewater again with the Fortune Croker. Um, old Babs has had a few mishaps, killed a few locals in her time, but I suppose it helps lend an air of authenticity. <laughs> So, here we have a huckster, another one of Tom Kench's followers, essentially. She's a huckster, she's someone who tells fortunes and brews potions and does all the sort of stereotypical voodoo priestess thing. And, again, we're not going to go into the problematic elements of cultural appropriation with voodoo and, its, and voodoo aesthetics and stuff like this. A whole other discussion that's worth having, but it's not really what this stream is about. Just want to point out that that's a thing that's there. Um, but that's basically what she's playing off of, is sort of the cultural stereotype of the swamp witch voodoo priestess um, kind of character, like who's cooking lizards into stews and has got potions and arcane things and weird stuff just hanging out all over her space, um, and who is herself, like, identified both with 
visual signifiers of excessive femininity. Um, in the sense that like, she's wearing this uh, ostentatious eyeshadow, she's got this jewelry thing going on, but also very monstrous, like very much not a traditional feminine beauty, which again, problematic discussions to be had about the ways the beauty and ugliness are operationalized. Mm -hmm. Anyway, that's a whole different thing. Um, but there is this contrast between like the femininity and beauty that she's clearly trying to portray and the actual reality of her body itself, which is her inner monstrousness essentially externalized in her character design. Um, and that, as a character piece, in terms of working within those tropes, that works pretty well. And I'm, I mean, personally, I just like seeing characters that don't necessarily look conventionally attractive being in the game at all, because that's something in League of Legends main. Riot are so fucking terrified of having ugly characters in the game that they've been systematically retconning them out of existence. Poor Swain. Poor Trundle. Uh, so it's like, it's nice that Le Legends of Runeterra is willing to actually have characters that are visually ugly, like that, that lean into that as a character design piece. Uh, so I enjoy that. Anyway, framing, again, relatively obvious. We have like the cook pot, the potions, and then this stuff hanging in the foreground, creating this space for her to occupy that she dominates. She's lit from below, from the light of the whatever the hell it is that she's brewing, um, which gives her a completely different color temperature than the background. Like she's mostly greens, blues, uh, bright white, that's most of what, like, the color that defines her. But then her the backdrop, the environment that she's in, is all oranges and, like, sunlight and browns and earth tones all over the place. So she stands out really strongly against the background um, that, that she's in. And that works pretty well. I do like the big fluffy uh, hat thing that she's got going on. The big, like, the ostentatious hat, which is so often an element of, like, witch characters. Which work quite well. Let's see. Rune Weaver, I believe, is the next one. So this card is a little boring um, in some ways. Um, like, she's another one of the hunters who's chasing down Riven. I believe that this is the lady who was in Riven's level up art. I believe it's this girl. No, wait, maybe it's not. She has an axe rather than a sword. Could be it's a different person. Certainly similar uniform because they're both Noxians. So I guess uh, in that sense, it makes sense. Um, but the card here is a little bit boring in the sense that there really is, like, there really is only the character in it. We don't really get a sense of what the environment is, where she is, why she's doing whatever the hell it is that she's doing to the sword, attaching runes to it by the looks of it. Um, which is uh, just some wind that's kicked up by the action itself, and then this gray, steely sky backdrop that tells us very little about what's actually happening. So... Not not much environmental storytelling going on here. The only storytelling we get is the relationship between her and her weapon, which just seems to be doing magic stuff to it, thrumming with arcane power or whatever. Um, which works well enough, I suppose. And it's, it, what's in, the only interesting thing about this this art, really, I feel like, is that the sword is kind of more the main character than she is. Because it's, it's in the foreground in front of her. It cuts across her body. It kind of takes up more space. It kind of dominates the situation more than she does. And then she's the secondary character to the sword's main character. Sort of. Uh, but I said that there's not much framing going on. Like the leaves kind of do the job of sort of cutting off a bunch of negative space in order to create a, a, a space for her to operate within. But eh, it's not bad. It's not bad art at all. There's just not a lot about it that excites me. Let's see. I haven't missed any, have I? Did we, is the patched poor robot new? I think it is. I think the patched poor robot is new. I don't think that was in the initial release. And, but it kind of was. Like, the patched poor robot was part of, um... It was part of the training mode at one point or another, wasn't it? I think uh, it like it showed up before, but now it's become an actual official card that's actually in the game. Uh, but it's adorable. I like, it's a very cute little thing, um, and I, I do like the like the approximation. Like you have you create this poro shape clearly out of like scrap metal and bits of badly whittled wood. Um, like it's a child's creation that's not quite rightly put together with one horn off on the spring. Like it's 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 a cutesy little thing. Um, not, not a lot of environmental storytelling going on here, like, in terms of telling us where is the Poro, why does it exist, who made it, what's it for, what's it trying to do. 
don't really get much of that. We can just see that it's like in some kind of crawl space beneath a uh, lab, like it's been discarded and thrown down there as, as trash or garbage or something along those lines. Maybe. Maybe the place is on fire. It's not really clear. There's lots of sparks flying through the air. There's some orange in the background. Not 100% clear on what's going on, but framing is pretty obvious. We have all this debris in the foreground, especially creating, and then also this um, crossbeam in the background, creating a room for the little Poro to occupy. And then we have the light coming in from the side, highlighting the Poro itself, while leaving most of the rest of the scene in a relative shadow. Sparklefly. Not much of a character here, because it is just a set of geometric shapes that fly around over some stuff. Um, but apparently it is connected to the Lunari and flies around on the night blossoms or the whatever that they are cultivating, which are a source of some magic powder or something that they use to do their thing. And we can see that in the Lunari priestess here in the background with a lot of her decorations and especially the moon tattoos across her face. But pointedly, her eyes are cut off. Like, we don't get to see, we get to see that she has a face, but we don't get to see her eyes. And that matters in a character design because... The eyes, to use a cliche, is the window to the soul, right? And that's kind of true in the sense that the human brain is programmed fundamentally to look for eyes in things. Like, that's the one of the first things we identify as a thing that makes a face is eyes. And you can test this out yourself, actually. You can draw a circle and then put two dots, like sort of two-thirds of the way up in the circle next to each other, and your brain will immediately be willing to see that as a face with two eyes in it. That's how smileys work. If you add a single little curved line underneath the eyes, then you have a mouth, and then all of a sudden you cannot help but see it as a face. Um, so cutting them off here prevents this Solari Priestess from becoming a main character of the piece. If the face was visible, when you saw the splash art, you'd look away from the geometric shape and instantly go to the character, the person because the brain is just programmed to behave that way. So get rid of the eyes and we can make something else the main character of the piece. In this instance, the sparkle fly, um, which is flying around doing butterfly stuff on the flowers, being framed mostly, yeah, by the Solari Priestess and the flowers themselves. Not really a very explicit frame here. Let's see, Star Spring. The first of the landmarks that we'll be looking at. And because it's a landmark, of course, it operates a little bit differently than a character image. Character images, usually, um, like we just talked about with the Solari Priestess, there's a focus on getting the face in there, of giving you something identifiable to latch onto, that you can see, that you can, that you can empathize with. But because this is a landscape, again, we're doing the same thing. Don't let any of the characters' faces be too visible. Don't let them steal focus and attention away from the thing that really matters. And you can also see that in the coloring choices, that these characters are all desaturated and in shadow, while the fountain itself, the star spring, is all bright and lit and has like these vibrant, saturated colors that makes it really stand out against the relatively darker backdrop and background um, that defines the rest of the image, which again is how you use color, framing, and aesthetic to create a central character out of something that really isn't a character sort of in its own right. <coughs> Um, and that works really well. It's a really gorgeous scene. Like, just, again, the colors that they're using in these cards. You have the, like, you have the drab gray and the white of the snowy Targon Mountain, right? And then these, like, giant stone arches, which are so functionally black in the image. Or, well, dark gray, anyway. And then you have, like, the slow accumulation of color. Yeah, you have these dark teal and dark greenish blue hues of the leaves as we get closer and closer to the fountain. And then at the fountain itself, you have these little shocks of pink like these bright pink flowers all of a sudden that show up and then the spring itself bright cyans and teals that cascade down from this floating green rock which again has much more color floating around like it's a beautiful gorgeous use of color to create a scene and create an image so the starry sky oh hello there's a thing Ah, that's, uh, that's a donation. Here's 350 for one of my favorite art character design content creators. You are, as the kids would say, swell. Oh, thank you very much, Cena. That's very kind of you to say. Um, so, Starry Scamp. Here, the framing is painfully obvious. Like, you have the Solaris um, staff, and the little window that he's sitting in creates a frame that separates him visually from the Solari, which kind of explains, like, 
when you when you create these frames that separate characters, in fact, I can show you with, uh, let's see. I'm going to have to undo one of our filters here. So in terms of visual storytelling, when you create a visual barrier in an image between two characters, it's a very easy shorthand to indicate that they can't, like, that this character can't see this one over here. Like, this, this lady can't see Lux because there's this visual separator between them protecting her from, like, Ultra Karen coming here with her badge and uh, Gestapoing her way into the, into the house there. Same kind of thing is going on with the little scamp. Let's see if we can find him again. Where did you go, my little friend? Further down, further down, further... Oops, too far. There. Same thing going on here. We have this separating barrier between the two characters, again, helping to explain visually that they're in the same space, but this lady hasn't seen him yet. She can't see him yet. She won't see him until it is entirely too late um, <laughs> because he's taking aim at her. Like, I think he's t using one of her Solari badge things or whatever to shoot her with through the match. I'm not 100% sure what his goal is, like what he's trying to do, except just be a pest. Uh, but he's managing to succeed at that pretty well, I suppose. He's one of Zoe's followers, so being annoying is just par for the course, I guess. Um, again, the lighting. The Solari uh, priestess, soldier, warrior, whatever the heck she is here, is mostly in shadow. Like, there's a little bit of edge lighting going on with her, but mostly she's sort of desaturated and in shadow, whereas the little guy is fully lit up by some kind of light source. Theoretically, the torch down here, but let's be real, this is not a realistic lighting situation. Who's fully lit up. He's much more colorful, and that lets him steal the show there. Um, and, yeah. Again, as a storytelling scene, it works really well, although it's unclear to me why he's doing what he's doing, I guess, except just to be annoying, I suppose. Um, and in terms of visual cohesion, by the way, notice the proportions of this guy, this little kid. Like, he has much more Zoe-like proportions as a character. We talked about how Zoe um, is someone who, like, stands out from pretty much everyone else in League of Legends because she is so Disney-deformed. Like, she has such a cartoony Disney face. And that's also true of a bunch of her followers. Like, the Spacey Sketcher kind of has that with, like, the very large eyes and the very little button nose thing. She's a little older in her proportions than Zoe. And the witch, where is she? The Yeah, the young witch has the same thing as well, with like these very large eyes, this very little nose, and these sort of um, tangled, frozen proportions. So there's this little visual cohesion thing going on between Zoe and her followers. Same thing with the Giddy Sparkleologist, where they all kind of have the same style of proportions that kind of ties them together as characters and contrasts them with like pretty much everything else in League of Legends, and Legends of Runeterra especially. So, the Startled Stomper, that thing was part of the previous expansion, right? Like, I think we've talked about this card before. Yeah, I'm reasonably sure we have. Which lets us move on to the Stony Suppressor. And I really like the character design of the sculpture in, in this card. Like, I really like... She just has a cute outfit, but also... That again, she like she feels like she has a real body with room for organs in it. Like, like I've said before... Legends of Runeterra has no problem designing bodies that feel, like, moderately feasible on women. They just don't do it on their damn champions for some goddamn reason. What I really like about her character design is that her outfit is a explicitly feminine. Like, it has a very, like, the little skirt. We've got the poofy, um, like, the, the poofy sleeves and stuff. It's very explicitly feminine, but it's not sexualized. Like, it's not one where it's femininity is used to make her sexy. It's one where femininity is just used to make her feminine and cute. Which is a nice thing to have when so many other female characters in fantasy art so often, like, there's no way to be feminine without also being sexy, which is annoying and tiresome. So it's nice just to see a good character design that doesn't do that every once in a while. Anyway, uh, <laughs> Chad is going wild with Badger, 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 Mushroom. What an old, old, uh, what an old reference. <clears throat> um, so, main characters in the, in the art piece. Theoretically, the Stony Suppressor is the main, because it's the thing that makes the spells cost more and does the thing, right? Theoretically, that's the main character, but in terms of framing, the main character is actually the lady here. And she's framed by the, like, bright golden-looking ropes that hang down from this thing. 
and she's lit up by the light that comes in through the scene. So she's really the main character, the main person who's acting, who's doing something in the shot. And then the secondary character would be the stony suppressor itself, like the, the sculpture, the statue that's supposed to be anti-magic. And then we have a couple of uh, tertiary characters hanging out in the background, mostly desaturated, same as pretty much everything else we've talked about. And again, colors. She's wearing an outfit that matches her environment, right? So she has these bright white uh, all over her outfit. She has the gold, which matches like the general accents of Demacia and stuff. But she's also got a lot of darker elements, like the waistcoat out of the leather, her hair, her gloves, the thing around her waist, that helps her stand out against the sheer whiteness of just most of this environment. Like, she stands out as a little bit of an ocean of more color um, than, the, than the rest of the environment, which helps. Uh, so I think it's just, it's a really nice character. I really like this costume. Like, I'd like to know more about this character, who she is, what she does, like what it entails being a sculptor making these things for Demacia. Presumably carving them out of petrocyte, I have to imagine. Right, Tiare, the Crescent Guardian, Doom Beast, Stellacorn, Fussy Caretaker. I think we looked at him at all already too, right? Hang on, I should really have the list of cards up. The trouble is that the, the game will let me filter for like, um, for Call of the Mountain, but it won't let me filter for the individual expansions to the things. I'm just kind of relying on my memory to remember whether or not I've talked about a character before. Yeah, we already saw him. Yeah, you're right. So I guess we move on to the Hexcore Foundry. Yes. Um, with a little bit of uh, narration from Victor. And again, in terms of making a building the main character, we're doing the same thing. We are ensuring... Well, we can see, by the way, um, the arm cannon robot guy uh, that we looked at previously just hanging out in the background. But no faces, no identifiable characters who can draw our attention and draw our eye. All the humans in the scene, by the way, are dwarfed by the actual main character, which is this giant lightning spark building, which seems very safe and OSHA compliant. Um, they're all dwarfed by it. They are all tiny relative to it. And one interesting thing is that when you look at romantic landscape art, like landscape art by the, from the romantic period, they use the exact same trick. And for them, it was a thing of like making the human characters really small to emphasize the grandness and the overwhelming, like the majestic nature of nature itself, of the natural environment. Here, it's being used for the same effect, but for, to create that same overwhelming feeling for something entirely artificial, which is the city of Son here in the background, and the Hexcore Foundry itself. This giant, like, sparkly monolith of a thing that's clearly being singled out by all the lightning that's coming out of it, creating this white aura around it, literally separating it from the background, almost, creating this building that, like, the building itself isn't really that interesting, right? It's just some slabs of metal across a square thing that's... Nothing interesting about the building, but the things that the building is doing draws our attention and makes it stand out as something exceptional. Which also, again, colors. Blue, uh, like electric blue, white lightning all over the sides of this building, where everything else is enveloped in this green, yellowish, gray haze and smoke, and like these tiny little pinpricks of light illuminating things. This thing is like, bzz, 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 like an incandescent light bulb in the middle of a dark space, which draws the attention to us or draws the attention to it, rather. Another lovely character design, well, another few lovely character designs, actually. The Lounging Lizard, um, <laughs> who's just, look at this dandy motherfucker with his little waistcoat and uh, his, his frilly little shirt thing and <laughs> picking things out of his teeth with a toothpick and his eyebrows that poke out and it's like, what a lovely character. Like, he looks slippery. He looks kind of slimy. He looks kind of untrustworthy. Just, just the moment you see him, you're like, oh, yeah, no, hmm, probably can't trust that guy. And if you follow his tail over to the pocket of uh, this rather brusque-looking fellow here, you'll see that, yeah, no, you definitely can't trust the lounging lizard at all. So, framing, um, he's very much kept out of the way in this image because that's kind of the point of the story that's being told here is that something important and big is happening right here. This little guy is being shaken down, I guess, for all he's worth. 
and this guy's just hanging just out of sight, just a little bit away from the action so as not to draw attention, grabbing a fat stack of cash for himself. And so he's framed, he's separated again. Remember when we talked about uh, Lux against the Mage Seeker and the little scamp against the Solari? We have this visual barrier in the image separating him physically from the thing that's happening over here. So he's not really part of the same space. He's separated from it, therefore safe from it. And he's got golden light all over him, like he's very lit up. He's in a very bright part of the scene, whereas over here, everything's a little bit darker, everything's a little bit more in shadow. And I do like the character design of, like, this sword, fish, nose, monster, man, person, thing, whatever he is, <clears throat> in the foreground, with, like, using his nose literally as a knife, essentially, like, to, to threaten this poor little... fish? Per I don't know what he's supposed to be. He looks kind of like a... a like a, a Gungan from Star Wars, but without the beak. Uh, whatever he's supposed to be. I, I do like the little thing of just like literally having him use his swordfish nose as a, <laughs> as a pointy implement. I like the addition of the giant crocodile dude with the cigar in the backdrop. You can see he's like literally, there's no escape for this guy. He's sandwiched in between these two giant dudes who are going to take him for all he's worth. Um, which I think is lovely. I, I also like that the guy has a little tiny red butterfly in this purple waistcoat. He looks like such a little dandy. Like, he looks like he's dressed up all prim and proper for Mother's Party. Oh, yes, I should desire some treats very much so. Whereas this guy's wearing, like, a leather jacket. <laughs> Looking like a biker or something. Like, he's clearly come to the wrong part of town, poor little fool. <laughs> Let's see. Next would be the Monastery of Hirana, I suppose. Again, lots of uh, human characters in the scene, but no visible faces, nothing that can distract us from the grandeur of the space itself. And the environment, the monastery, is the main character because it overshadows and just vastly outsizes everything else that is present in the scene. This is how you make the scene itself the main character of the thing, even in spite of having actual characters in the scene. So they become part of the environment, rather than being characters that are in the environment. Um, which again, works really well. And color-wise, like the main character in terms of, like, just sort of the main character in terms of color is this bright red-orange tree, like, poking into the sky and the beautiful golden hour lighting coming down on the leaves. Like, it's just a Gorgeous, gorgeous color combination. Those bright reds contrasted against like the white and green of these sheer cliff rock faces. Like, ah, oh, beautiful. Like, it just looks like a place you want to go and take pictures, man. It's great for the Instagram. <clears throat> Absolutely gorgeous. Ah, the Neandroid. <laughs> Which would be uh, Professor Fun Yip in a sort of approaching his final form, I suppose. Ah, <laughs> uh, yes, Professor Fun Yip, the guy we thought was the scientist, but who is actually the cat, as it turns out, who has some kind of invisibility cloak engine thing going on on him, which makes sense because he's elusive. <clears throat> So this is a joke card, kind of. Like, it's a silly card with Daz, the evil robot cat who is trying to take over the world. It's like Pinky and the Brain style. Essentially with his little mlem, little, little tongue poking out of his mouth, but then this deadly killer instinct eye staring out from under a big fat tuft of adorable white fur on his little body, poking out from... Again, the contrast here is between the softness of his fur and his kitty catty little adorable face and the hard robot body with clearly lethal capabilities that he has made himself to occupy. Not pictured in this splash art is the laser tail that he's also got attached to himself, which I think is a little bit of a pity. Like, the laser tail seems like a good thing. Imagine if he started chasing his tail by accident and shot himself in the face with a laser. Maybe that's why he has a robot eye now. Who knows? <laughs> But yeah, framing, uh, it's not that much of it. You can see the chain over here. You can see, like, the mechanical needle thing, whatever the hell here in the foreground, creates a little bit of framing around him. But mostly he just stands out because in an environment that's full of hard shapes and, like, sharp surfaces and metal and everything, he's got a giant, fluffy, adorable little kitty cat face that stands out. Oh, he's so pretty and precious. Who's pretty and precious? You are. Yes, you are. And as people are pointing out in the chat, yes, he's a bit of a mini Rengar with the eye patch thing going on. 
Anyway, Spring Guardian, another one of Soraka's followers, and therefore another one of the caretakers of the adorable little Stella Corns. Um, and yeah, it's apparently Soraka is not a Vistaya at all, but she lives among this tribe of Vistaya who sort of take on visual aspects that are reminiscent of Soraka herself. Uh, Laurie Goulding, one of the uh, Riot Scathlock, one of the narrative editors at Riot, sort of explained it that way that probably the Vistaya have sort of taken after Soraka rather than Soraka taking after the Vistaya. But that's. Uh, Discussion for another time. So, two characters in this image. We have the little Stella Corn who's fallen in the spring um, and who needs to be fished out by this uh, goat friend. And then we have the goat friend himself, who is the main character of the piece. And you can see that he's the main character because the lighting is telling you. So, the Stella Corn is mostly in shadow, like it's mostly dark and it's like not really lit very well. Whereas he clearly has a spotlight on him straight from the heavens that highlights all of his features and everything that he is. And we've got a little bit of framing going on with um, like the edges of the spring and these plants. And the Stella Coin itself kind of creating this space here for him to occupy against the background. And also a little bit of color. Now, the color choice is here interesting because there's actually not that much difference in color and color temperature between the sort of bright orangey reddish, sort of slightly pinkish of the golden light in the background and then the actual purple fur that this guy has on him. But there's a little bit of a clever thing being done with saturation where he's much more saturated than the background is in a lot of ways, which helps him stand out as a contrast anyway, while still feeling very much like he belongs there, like he's part of the environment. He's a lovely character. Like, uh, I feel like he could use a few more identifying details. Sort of like if it feels like there's something missing in terms of making him really unique the same way that grandfather Rommel is but yeah it's a conversation for a different time I suppose Oh, we've got a bunch of landmarks coming up. Okay, the Grand Plaza first uh, I'm not 100% sure whether this is meant to be Tiana Crown Guard. Uh, it could be but she's blonde not white-haired so I don't necessarily think it's her whomever it is once again because the actual main character of the piece is the landmark the face of the character is looking away and we only get to see the horse's ass uh, that she is because she's a Damasian and Damasians are all assholes um but yeah uh, this one is interesting because this is the only one of the of the landmarks we've looked at so far where the there's actually like an identifiable person who is not massively dwarfed by the entire environment right like with the monastery, with the hex core thing, all the time the human characters are these tiny little things that sort of just barely occupy any space in the image. In Demacia, though... Oh, where did it go? Where are you? There you are. In Demacia, though, we have probably Tiana Crown Guard, um, who actually occupies enough space to be a character. Like you can see from the top of her banner to the bottom of uh, her horse's shoe, she's pretty much the same height in the image as the giant landmark itself, which is this giant Damasian statue and the plaza itself. Uh, so that's interesting, like, that we get to have a little bit more of a, of a person domineering the space, which is probably because she's giving some kind of stupid speech to the assholes about how mages should be killed or whatever. Like, some Karen shit that we don't want to listen to. Um, probably. But still, the environment remains the main character, because, well, the only thing that approximates a face that we get to look at is on the helmet of the giant statue over here, whereas this is more of a feature of the environment rather than a character in the environment. Lovely colors as well. Like, um, like again, Tiana standing out against, I'm just going to assume it's her, standing out against the environment because she has these dark, saturated blues that really kind of help um, push her apart from it, but then still subordinate in her color scheme to the thing itself. Like, it's very Gondor, isn't it? Like, Demacia really is taking off from the white city of Minas Tirith hard these days. They've pushed that really, really hard on Universe especially as well. And here, more than ever, like, this looks like a scene straight out of Lord of the Rings with a little bit of Warhammer thrown in for good measure. Which is interesting, although I really do wish Demacia would have more of a visual identity for itself rather than just looking like knockoff uh, Gondor a lot of the time, or I guess... Would that be Anor? Realm of Men sunk below the seas? I haven't read Lord of the Rings in a long time. Moving on to the Scar Grounds. Here again, back to the familiar thing. Lots of characters, but no faces. We can see the unscarred Reaver hanging out here. 
probably some other characters that you'll recognize from uh, Winter's Claw associated cards if you look really closely. But clearly the character, the dominating force here itself is this weird ass motherfucking thing that they've built out of boats that are just kind of stacked together in sort of this semi-chaotic random jumble piled up high like for a bonfire that's never going to happen. It's a really striking visual, right? Like cuz we're clearly on land, like we're not we're not obviously right near the sea, but they've taken the time to drag these boats which clearly symbolize something like the boats are for raiding, the boats are for piracy for fighting for getting to the war or whatever like whatever these things signify to the winter's claw they are important enough that they made an edifice out of them and constructed this entire like sacrificial place with bone and like it looks very random and chaotic but it's also clearly very intentional like it's very much they wanted these things to be here they wanted to add all the shit to the pile so you get this storytelling of like okay this is clearly incredibly important to someone because otherwise why go to all the effort to make this bizarre thing um so you get the sense of its ritual importance like the only reason to make something like this would be for some kind of ritual it would be for some kind of religious service otherwise like why do it um so that works really that works really well. And then we have the little tiny human characters like very clearly subordinate, like literally falling on their knees, kneeling in front of the fire at the heart of this thing. And this is the only real source of light that we have in the image also is the torches and the giant um, brazier at the middle of it, lighting up the place. The only source of warmth, the only source of heat that isn't just dominated by the grays and the blacks and the whites of this snowy, desolate landscape on this frozen lake that we're sitting on right here. It's a gorgeous way to create a really in interesting, intricate landmark that's like, that's clearly some kind of mystery at the heart of it. Like, there's some kind of cultural context that we lack in order to understand what this thing is. That one, That's what makes it fascinating. Speaking of landmarks, moving on to the slaughter docks. And here, we have a character whose face is visible. All the way down in the lower left corner, we get to see uh, someone, finally. But for the most part, Faces are hidden away, eyes especially are hidden away, made sure they're not too intrusive. And we have the framing of the thing where sort of, if there is a main character in the piece, it's this dead, I guess it's a jawfish probably, that's hanging upside down, down from the slaughter docks right here. Like outlined against the brightness of the sky with a golden sun right behind it, casting a shadow across it. And then as for the rest of it, the scene itself is the character of the place. It's like all this detritus of the sea, like these jawbones from ancient monsters, these other beasts that are being hauled up on the docks and slaughtered. <clears throat> the birds, the people dragging bits of flesh and fish around, and maybe, I don't, I can't 100% tell, but I think that guy right there is the gunpowder sergeant character in Gangplank's crew uh, who can either summon a one cost or a, a powder keg. I think that's him right there with a little visual reference, I guess, to another card. Much more busy scene uh, than the rest of it. There isn't really a central, <clears throat> there isn't really a central landmark in this image the same way that there is with like the hex tech, um, the hex core repository place um, for Piltover and so on. The whole of the thing, the whole of the place, the slaughter docks themselves are the character rather than a single edifice that stands out. Right, I need a sip of tea, I think. I always tell myself that I'm going to talk slower this time. I'm, I'm going to spare my voice a little bit more this time, and I never do. I always talk too fast. I always have too much stuff to say. <clears throat> anyway, Trevor Snoothbottom, uh, who is sleep flying, I guess, through... He's a Yordle. He lives in Bandal City. He's sleep flying through some part of the glades that surround Bandal City dimensionally and dragging... Um, manifesting these little dream sprite creatures that follow him around as he's flying through things. Um, it's a kind of, he's kind of a funny little character. Like, he looks like someone's grandpa, just a lot smaller. Um, 
with the permanent bed head of the big fluffy fur tufts that he's got going on. He's outlined by the bright light of his uh, fairy wings and by the bright light that hits specifically his head and sort of creates this focus on him in the scene. There isn't as much of an explicit framing, though, as you would get in a lot of other cards. He's sort of the main character mostly by virtue of being the biggest character in the image, with the secondary characters being the little... What are they called? They have a specific name. Mumble sprites uh, that he's manifesting in the environment. Can you show some gameplay? No, that's not what we're doing here, unfortunately. Uh, there's plenty of other gameplay videos if you want them. Uh, especially on my second channel, I have a gameplay series where I play through it. So if you're curious, you can go and watch that. But here we're just talking about the artwork itself and the mumble sprites, <laughs> who are clearly feisty little bastards with one of them knocking the other one the heck out. Um, and there is an interesting little connection um, between Trevor and his mumbled sprites in that they inherit his giant bushy eyebrows and this tuft of hair thing that he's got going on on him is represented on them as well. So there's a visual connection between Trevor Mumblebottom and the mumble sprites that he um, that he uh, that he manifests into the world. Again, colors are doing most of the uh, centering of the characters in this image. Everything else is green, blue, kind of desaturated, mostly sort of a, a neutral color forest scene and these guys are bright pink and kicking the shit out of each other with like little spittle flying around and fairy dust all over the place which makes them very much the main characters of the piece I'm going to be serious for a moment I unironically like Trevor's design yeah he's adorable like he's a cute little critter isn't he Diego he's an adorable little character and he has some fun voice lines as well when you put him into the game, like with the other characters reacting to him like, Oh no, Trevor, no, don't! Because <laughs> he's flying into danger all the time. <sighs> now, the broad back I think we've looked at before, so we can move on to the Brutal Hunter! And I appreciate a bald woman um, in a fantasy video game, that's kind of rare. Because, like, hair is one of, from, from a character design perspective, hair is one of the best ways to express a character's femininity. Like, it's, it's one of the best shorthands that we have. Where you just go, okay, give some elaborate long hair with some uh, hair ornaments or something, and you can sell the femininity of a character like that, no problem. So having a woman who doesn't have her hair, that presents a bit of a character design challenge because that can often make the character very androgynous and kind of kill her femininity. Sometimes that's the part of the point, of course. Um, like that you don't want the character to appear feminine. You want to defeminize them. You want to androgynize them and take away their gender identity a little bit. But that's not really what's happening here. She still very much has a feminine aspect to her. Not just because she has visible cleavage, which is another very easy shorthand to create a female character, but also because she's flanked by visibly female characters and just the construction of her face, like the fact, the way that you've just very subtly implied mascara um, on the edges of her eyes still gives her that feminine aspect. And I like that. Like, I like that it's a bald woman rather than someone who's been androgenized or has their has that their gender identity removed from the character design. Because uh, that's kind of a rare thing to see. So that's nice. There's a little bit of diversity. Anyway, we've talked about a bunch of stuff um, before in terms of characters being framed as dominant, like controlling the frame, being the main characters of the piece. And all of that is on display here as well. Physically, she takes up the most space. And the lighting favors her. Like you can see all the other characters a little bit more washed out and a little bit more sort of um, yeah, desaturated relative to her. She's also got a very like a strong expression with the scream going on and those piercing eyes looking like straight at something which she's clearly attacking. I wish her pose was a little bit more active maybe because it kind of just looks like she's leaning backwards and getting ready to do something cool, where it might have been nice to have her in a slightly more dynamic action pose, like one leg forward or like springing into action or something. That could probably add a little bit more dynamism to the scene, but the pose itself does a good job of centering her in the image and making her the main character. Then we have the secondary character, and it has a character design. What the hell is that helmet? Like, what is this? This is a Spider-Man mask with like a mohawk on it, except... Very, very strange. And the bear midriff, this is a really odd, like, relative to the character design of this lady, which is not, like, practical, really, like, with the belts across her midriff. That must constrain her terribly. Uh, but, like, this just looks kind of 1990s Warhammer fantasy 
esque, like very kind of cheesy and silly relative to. Like, this looks more like something that could appear on Game of Thrones, right? This looks more like it's a, from something from He Man. <laughs> and the same thing kind of goes for the lady in the background here. Like, with the like with the big giant chest plate and then the bare midriff, which again is like, is she trying to be armored or is she not? Like, could you make a decision about what you want this lady to be? But oh, well, whatever. She's, they're background characters, they're not that important. So, here's a little bit of a continuation of uh, some of the storylines that were happening in the previous expansion. We have Tiari the Traveler and the Mountain Sojourners that he's traveling with up the, to the top of the mountain where... Oh no, Tiari is they. He's non uh, they're non-binary, actually. They use they-them pronouns before ascending to the mountaintop, at which point they transition into a female character called the Traveler. Which is one of the cool little stories that were happening in the cards of Legends of Runeterra. Um, like, this journey that you follow where Tiara, like, starting at the very bottom of the mountain, helping his friends, like, meeting characters like the Mountain Scryer, and where is he? The Mentor of the Stones, like, who guides them all the way up the path, and then eventually Tiari seems to be the only one who actually reaches the peak, and, like, gets to, like, have, have like, that magical transformation. And the other ones, Anoxian and a Demacian, which is interesting, like, from different nations who are still trying to ascend. We don't know what happens to them. Presumably they don't make it, <laughs> which is a little dark, but, hey, it's not one of those cool uh, story beats that happen in the background. Anyway, so the Crystal Ibex, once again, not really the main character of its own card. Like, it's the main character once, once we pull out the frame and actually look at look at the card itself, but in the splash art, the main characters are Tiara and his two companions that are being carried atop this crystal ibex, and clearly Tiari running to catch up with the rest of them. Um, those seeking to scale Targon would do well to befriend the local fauna. No creature is more familiar with Targon's perilous gauntlet, and none can travel more swiftly across its ice's terrain. So this is part of their journey, where they manage to befriend the Crystal Ibex, which is clearly associated with Tarek in some way, that helps them across some crucial part of, um, of the climb, some difficult snowstorm or something along those lines. And I like the detail of this right here. This little golden imitation of the Crystal attachments or whatever that the Ibex naturally has, has been tied around its horn. Clearly someone has done that, and presumably that will have been something that Tiara and his companions, di uh, their companions did in order to gain its trust or something along those lines. Like, they, this this thing clearly has some kind of significance, some kind of symbol to indicate that, that there is a bond or that this thing is friendly or something along those lines. It's a lovely little detail where, like, color-wise, this golden thing just stands out so well from the purple of the crystal on the rest of it that you just go, oh, oh, okay, that's, mm, that's clearly, something is important about this thing that's been attached to it, like, this matters somehow, which is interesting, like, that's, that's a good little mystery in the storytelling that's fun to speculate about and think about. <laughs> Let's see, Scryer, Sunforger. Look at this Count Olaf looking motherfucker right here. <laughs> I don't know, did anyone else watch a series of unfortunate events with Jim Carrey? Very much that kind of character design with, like, the pointy hair going up in all directions for some reason. I can only see old Rakan. Yeah, old Rakan, that's also a valid... <laughs> that's also a valid option for him. Uh, old, weird Rakan. So, framing. We've got the uh, circular whatever things hanging down from the ceiling, creating a frame around the upper parts of his body and his character, which creates a framing for his face. And this thing, whatever the hell it is that he's using to, I guess, make the weapon somehow? I don't know, some kind of Solari magic? Um, and then there's a little bit of an interesting secondary framing where it's the light that's being used to create. You can see how the light washes out the background. So we have this like rocky dark background over on the left that washes out with the light. And so the light column here itself becomes a frame around the whole of the character and the spear thing that he's forging. Axe, pole arm, whatever it is. Creating this space for the character to occupy with a secondary frame of the ring up here drawing our attention to the two most important things, which is the guy, the arm, and holding the whatever this is. I guess he's spinning the material out from the sphere in the middle somehow with some magic. Who knows? And he's a very distinctive character. Like, that 
giant long goatee thing that he's got going on, and that like the pointy cilian hair that he's got that he's rocking. He's clearly important. I don't know that he looks that much like a smith, like as a character. Like I feel like he could have something that looks less like a priest and more like he actually works with metal and stuff. But I guess for the Solari, that's probably the same thing. Is that is like smiths will dress like priests because the forging of weapons is a holy act or something. Which, as environmental storytelling go, is, is is quite interesting. Ah, the Stargazer. That was the name I was looking for previously. So she's the lady who um, returns the Stellacorns once they've spent enough time on Mount Targon being cared for by the shepherds. She returns them to the sky in a sudden blaze of starlight and flailing hooves. And again... Riot with the thing of like this very, very tiny little, little, little bitty waist that seems to be sl more slender than her thigh. And which again, how do you get organs in there and not like squeeze them to death? Who knows? But it's less important here. Like with Riven, the trouble was that she lives this hard life of farming and fighting that you would kind of expect to give her like some freaking core muscle strength, right? Like some actual abs and shit. This lady is more of a sorceress kind of fey creature living on top of a mountain doing magic stuff. And so, okay, if you want to stylize her by making her like ultra thin and lanky and really, really slender. Okay, fair enough. Like, we can roll with it. The trouble isn't every character that's slender. The trouble is that they do this by default oftentimes rather than out of any consideration for the character design. Here, I think it's being used a little bit like because every part of her is really kind of thin and slender from her hair to like the long tail to the legs. Every part of her is very sort of thin and elfin and really slender. So here, I think it's more intentional. Here, I think it's at least like more part of the character design. Um, whereas with Riven, it's just like, no, like that she wouldn't look like that. That's not the life she leads. Um, but so, and but because it's such a default, because they do it all the time, I'm suspicious every time that it's not an intentional part of the character design, but just because, oh, we do it with all the other ones, so why not do it with this one as well? So I don't know. And, and that's the trouble, is like when you have this stylistic kink in the, in the whole art style of the thing, then even when it shows up in a good place where it makes sense, you kind of grow suspicious and you go, eh, was that really a considered design choice or were you just going with the default again? Anyway, love the colors on the Stellacorns as they fly into the sky. Like, I love the purple-blue, um, like, the mixture there that kind of looks like a kind of uh, reverse Aurora Borealis. Like, it has that kind of that kind of ethereal sense of it. I love the little sparkles flying all around them. I love the Stellacorns themselves that are just, like, whoa, flailing in the air. Like, oh, God, what's going on? Like a cat that's falling out of a window or something. Which I think is just adorable. They're cute as hell. I love the Stellacorns. They're such a good little character design. Creature design, rather. Anyway, her, she has a lot of color contrast with her environment because her backdrop is this, like, ethereal sky with Aurora Borealis effects going on all over the place and this very dark, stony, snowy backdrop thing that she's standing upon. She herself, though, is fluffy and purple, and she's got this bright red coat with this orange tail hanging down from it. She's got this staff, which has these dark, saturated browns standing out beautifully from the background. And while she herself is kind of wispy and purple up top, which makes her sort of more in line with the Stellacorns, she still contrasts the background, like this dark spot in the background really well and stands out as this really interesting figure posed in the center of the image. Kind of, you can, you can really tell just from the way that she's postured, the way that she's posed, that it's her magic. Like she's doing this thing, like this thing she's doing there is causing that thing to happen which is a lovely bit of visual storytelling. <laughs> right, moving on to Jack the Winner. Another one of the Tom Kench followers. Uh, he's an interesting one, isn't he? He's based on a goblin shark, I believe, which is a very peculiar... Actually, let me find a picture of a goblin shark. Because goblin sharks are cool as hell. And let me see if I can get that up on screen, just a sec. Uh, no, not that one. There we are. That's a goblin shark. Like, there is terrifying undersea creatures. Like, they can extend their jaws forward 
and eat their prey that way. They're they're partly what uh, the design of the alien um, from Alien is, is based on. So that's Jack the Winner. He's also based on uh, goblin sharks a little bit, and so are his minions here, I think, uh, to some extent or another. Um, <clears throat> but that, what an interesting way to create a goblin shark, <clears throat> to lean into this big, giant, muscle daddy kind of thing vibe with the beard and the, like, the open waistcoat and the big arms and stuff. Like, from that terrifying, ugly creature to create someone who is, like, clearly meant to be a lot more fuckable. <laughs> Um, is an interesting choice. Like you don't, you don't often see uh, game studios attempting to do that, but they've pulled it off, I think, with Jack. I've seen a lot of thirst for this guy. Um, oh, I already covered him. I did. Was he from the last one? Oh well, well, moving on then. So here again, like she doesn't have inner organs, obviously. Like this lady doesn't have organs, so it makes sense that she could have a very wasp thin waist, and the, that's not really it's not really a, a problem in that sense. My trouble with the mechanized mimic mimic though is like this thing is like she's clearly supposed to be some kind of infiltration bot, right? Like she clearly again it's the Victor problem, where she's supposed to be this like augmented human who has transcended the limitations of the human body and like who can do anything and can be transformed into anyone it's like ah oh, like she can mimic any person with her special optic and she just like looks like a lady in cosplay kind of where it's like but where's the mechanical body horror where are the claws where's where are the like the tubes spilling out of her guts like where's the where's the exotic shit where's the weird stuff instead we just get a completely standard hot lady body with, like, visible titty and a big fat ass. But we put some spikes on it, I guess, so now it's weird. It's like, yeah, she's hot, but it's... But that's not what the card is about, is it? She's a, supposed to be this terrifying infiltration bot that's, like, inhuman and scary, and instead she's just kind of vaguely sexy in a spiky robotic step-on-me-evil-lady way. Which is, like... Yeah, is that really the best you can do for a mechanized horror bot who can, like, eh, okay, fair, fair enough. I guess you wanted a waifu. <sighs> so that bores me a little bit in terms of character design. Framing, anyway, uh, the light coming down from the top, highlighting the main character itself. The framing being all the mechanical stuff around the sides creating this central space for her to occupy as she's being worked on by these much more interesting, much more scary mechanical disembodied arms, which, like, should be part of her body, surely. Like, a spider motif. Like, give her, like, a bunch of extra arms, like a big mechanical spider or something. Like, just anything to make her more interesting than just hot lady shape, but she's metal, so that's a robot now. Hmm. Whatever. Ah, the Nox Kraya Arena. Once again, plenty of human characters, but nary an identifiable face in sight. We have the uh, battle caster, like the guy shout, the previous card guy up here doing his thing, shouting at the actual fight. I believe this is the Minotaur Reckoner, uh, if I'm not much mistaken, having one of his fights in the arena, presumably before getting his ass handed to him by Draven. Again, the whole scene, the whole place itself the arena, is the main character, which again is being achieved by denying us of any particularly identifiable faces, and then highlighting, like, the, the scenes of action themselves by having this fire spewing out absolutely everywhere, like, raw, really highlighting the chaos and the power that this stage holds over the environment. It's like a WWE wrestling arena, basically, all pyrotechnics and flash and, like, and, um, and showmanship. Lovely. And again, you can see, like, the out, the out everything around the arena much more sort of desaturated, much more in shadow, but the re arena itself lit up brightly with these fireballs and flamethrowers. Beautiful. Let's see. I think uh, the Sneaky Zeebles would be the next one. And here again, we're continuing the story of the Mountain Sojourners, but uh, not seeing any of... Uh, Tiari in this particular image, just the sojourners themselves who are spotting these creatures flying out of one of, I guess, Zoe's portals, probably? Um, which are these little ferrets with wings, but also they're kind of fairies, sorta-ish, 
which they're adorable and they're cute. Um, and the framing again is painfully obvious because the framing is the portal itself, which creates this space for them to occupy that sets them apart from the two sojourners in the background. Um, who can then be, like, observing them as secondary characters in the image, while they go about their business mostly unconcerned with the troubles of mortals, little fairy otter, otter ferret creature things, whatever the heck they are. Manticore creature, like, oh, no, not manticore, chimera creatures, chimeric creatures is the proper word for them. Then we have Targon's Peak, where we have the Arbiter of the Peak hanging out right there up there on the top, uh, waiting for people to ascend. And this is the path that eventually Tiari will have to climb up at the last, with a little bit of help from Tarek, I believe. And we can really, uh, there's a framing going on here where you can see the clouds, like this ring of clouds sort of thrumming around the power of the mountain itself. But also, the, the way that the clouds around here kind of, they take on this sort of wedge upwards turned shape that kind of mimics the shape of the three pillars that hover around the peak itself, right? You can see how the environment essentially is deeply influenced by the shape of the pillars pil of Targon itself, which is like really, really gorgeous. And again, the lighting that they're using, all these chromatic aberrations and all these weird color auras that are all over everything. Just this scene that's thrumming with magical energy, like something weird is clearly going on here. Something magical, something transcendent. Like again, I just, I love the use of colors in these cards. Just the, the creativity and the freeness with which they use all kinds of clashing, weird, strange colors and bright neons that don't really make sense in this in this situation where they are. It's just, ah, gorgeous. So, University of Piltover. Here, interestingly, we have a clear main character with a main face. It's this statue <laughs> of Heimerdinger. And on the riot, re you need to clarify what the fuck yordles are. You need to, because Riot have like eight explanations for what yordles are and how they relate to the people who live in Runeterra. There's one explanation where the Yordles are hiding, and they're basically mythological creatures that barely exist, and nobody knows that they're real, and they're always hiding, and they're using magic to stay away from people, and like nobody knows that they're there. Then we have Legends of Runeterra, where Yordles are fucking everywhere. Like, they're, they're in Piltover, they're in Son, they're hanging out in Demacia, they're everywhere. Just Yordles all over the fucking shop, and everyone seems to know that the Yordles are there, and they're doing business with them, and they're trading with them, and, like, one of them runs an arena in Noxus, and the Yordles are just there, and people seem to be cool with it. Which one is it? Which one is it, right? Like, what, is there a special magic spell that makes this clearly Yordle statue of a Yordle called Heimerdinger, who is a Yordle, look like a human to people somehow? I don't know. You haven't explained it. What the fuck is the deal with Yordles? I can't make my video about it until you clarify it. Anyway, that's not what we we're talking about. Um, <laughs> main character is the statue of Heimerdinger, which is very well separated from the rest of the environment by being made of bright brass, golden, sort of bright golden brass, uh, with this glowing orb in the background, which stands out beautifully against, like, the green, the red, and the sort of earth tones and the neutrals of the rest of the environment, as well as the blue of the sky. So, like, that alone just makes the Heimerdinger thing stand out. It's also well lit, and it's in the center of the image. There we go. But can I just say... I really like the architecture in this image. Like, I really like this. Like, this looks so much like a university building, doesn't it? Like, yeah, it looks like kind of overblown and magical and there's clearly some hex tech nonsense going on with it, but it looks so much like the kind of, like if you go to England and like Oxford or whatever and these hyper ostentatious self-serious buildings full of wankers, like it, it looks like that kind of architecture made by people who think they're the most important things that society has ever produced and they need these most, most excellent uh, environments for our education to take. Like it looks self-serious and wealthy and imperial and ostentatious, like it's it has the right feeling for, like, a Piltover University, right? Even down to the ridiculous school gowns and caps of the dude walking past and doffing his uh, his little cap to Heimerdinger, the great professor. Yeah, it's, it's lovely. Like, it, 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 works, it works really well as, like, a kind of university environment to me. Moving on to something entirely different, though. The Vaults of Hela. At the center of what was once the Blessed Isles, one imagines, there they stand, the vaults of Hela. And looking really sort of Mordor scary. I think that's the Doom Beast down there, if I'm not much mistaken. Uh, um, 
uh, I can't be 100% sure, but the uh, Vaults of Hella just being this, like, this looks completely Mor Mordor. Like, this looks like, uh, what's it called? Minas Morgul, the home of the of the Witch King and the, and the Nazgul. Uh, th like, down to the color scheme, down to, like, the sheer stark, like, vertical structure of the whole thing, where everything just looks like this stake that has been driven into the earth, like this sword that's poking out of, of everything. It has that, that, that Hela Barad-Dur, um, stark, almost Noxian architecture, really. Like, it really doesn't look like it should be, uh, part of the Blessed Isles once upon a time. It looks like it was made by some evil sorcerer who seeks control over death and life. I like the perspective, like we have this uh, three-point perspective going on, I think, yeah. Uh, which like really sort of emphasizes the, the sheer size and length of this horrifying tower of a thing. And we have the shattered nature of the, of the Blessed Isles, like the way that the Shadow Isles are this broken version of what the Blessed Isles once was on display, just in the way that the ground itself seems shattered around the base of the tower. And then the framing being obviously the circles, like this circular plaza that the tower is situated within. Centering the thing and then it pokes right straight up into into the heavens looks scary as fuck Like it looks like a place like once you see it, you're already dead. You just don't know it yet Anyway, the wrathful rider we saw her previously in the hunter the the wrathful hunter or whatever her name was in her splash out with her silly helmet and weird spider-man mask She still looks kind of silly and weird, but it's a little bit less ostentatious now that she's seated atop a giant T-Rex creature, except it doesn't have arms, so maybe it's not a T-Rex creature, but it's a big lizard with teeth, is the point I'm making. Like, she looks, like when she's put next to something as ridiculous as this, it makes a little bit more sense that he has this mad max aesthetic thing going on. Um, once again, Riven, who could really, like, I like that she's got much more arm muscle here, like, she's much more clearly able to swing the sword, but still... That midriff is still smaller than her thigh, so I don't know, man. Really feel like could be more room for muscle there. Um, anyway, lovely combat scene here because we have the framing. Like, we have this falling tree, like, bursting out from the undergrowth. And we have, like, the, the vault of the crowns of the roofs of the leaves here creating this bright sky with the backlight highlighting this character. as like this is the latest challenger who's approaching Riven for a fight right now highlighting her really well, but Riven doesn't look, like, coward or intimidated. Like, she doesn't look small or, like, she can't handle it. In fact, in terms of size, Riven occupies almost as much space in the image as the rider and the lizard thing does. So, like, clearly this is a challenge. This is someone who's going to fight her, but Riven doesn't look like she's beaten just by the looks of it. Riven looks like she's ready for the fight. Don't know quite what her arm is doing there. That feels like it's too long for her actual anatomy to be able to support, but I don't know, it's, I guess, an action pose. Whatever. Um, so, like, so there's this sense of, like, two evenly matched opponents squaring off, but this is the main character of the image. Like, this is the camera swinging over to see the latest thing to approach Riven from behind that she has to kind of wheel around and face after probably dealing with the first hunter who couldn't kill her all on her own. So you get this lovely action beat. Like, this is, like, this is the moment where time slows down and this thing comes barreling out of the forest and you go, and he gets a... And Riven looks over at this thing and screams, and then action springs back into thing and stuff starts happening. Like that's the sense you get from it. That's the visual storytelling is that this is like this this moment of realization that oh shit, they have a dinosaur. Then we have Errol the Tracker, who is another one of the hunters who uh coming for Riven and well, failing to kill her. Um but there's an interesting composition going on here because Errol kind of isn't the main character of this image. She's a, she's a, well, a deuterogenist, rather. She's sharing the spotlight with her hunting hounds. And I don't know if it, like, you put these masks on these creatures, so I guess they can't bite whoever they're chasing, so I don't know how they're going to lock them down, but maybe they have claws? Who knows? Uh, however the hell that works. But she's kind of not the main character, like, they are sort of more the main character of the image than she is, but she is certainly the one who's directing the action. Because you have all of the hounds, the creatures, whatever the hell they are, completely covered in motion blur. Like, you can see that like they're, they're a little bit out of focus because they're moving so fast through the scene. By contrast, she's completely steady. Like, just steady as a rock, completely in focus. 
and standing there, outstretched finger, directing the action, so you can see that she's in control of what's happening, even if she's not the main visual character in the scene. And that works really well, even if her character design is still a little bit... Like, why the bear midriff? Like, why that thing? It seems like such a weird thing for Noxian soldiers. Because it's not like... No Noxian soldiers elsewhere in the card game don't really do that. I guess because they're hunters? I don't know. Who knows? There's probably some kind of bullshit reasoning for it. Anyway, the framing. We have these two trees right here, as well as the back of the hound there. Creates a beautiful frame for her to occupy, and then she pokes her arm out of the frame, breaking the bounds, and asserting a little bit of control and dominance over the scene. Color-wise, again, everything else is very desaturated, but she has this bright shock of red coming from her helmet, and coming from around her waist that really centers her in the image. Ha. <sighs> Okay, we've gone about another hour again, so I'm going to take a little break, and I'm going to throw to, uh, I'm going to cut here for an episode. We're still going to keep going with the stream, but this episode of The Thing, if you're watching it on the second channel, is over, which means I have to tell you to like, comment, subscribe, blah, 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 Patreon, merchandise store, tip jar, monetization, etc., etc. You can use it if you want, but if you don't want to, don't worry about it. Thank you very much for watching, and come back for even more Legends of Runeterra card reviews in the next episode. As for the rest of you, stay on stream. We're still going. <laughs>